today. Um, next week on July 30th, we're going to have Mike McMahon come and talk about beginning. computer backup essentials. And he's a good uh, computer techie, so that should be a. I muted you. I'm sorry. Okay, well, then I'll start again. Okay, next week, July 30th, we're going to have Mike McMahon call. Uh, talk about computer backup essentials. And um, that should be a very instructive, uh, very good program to attend, I think, for, for sure. Um, how we're going to work it today with the meeting is that um, we're going to mute everybody and then, you know, kind of um, take your, uh, your picture off. And then if you are one of the co-hosts, so, or hosts, you can unmute yourself if you need to talk. And then usually what we do is we go through the presentation itself and um, and any questions either can be uh, put into the chat feature on Zoom or we can hold them for later, but we usually answer the questions later. And we, we can do it either, I can read the questions to you guys, the ones that come up you know, when we're all done with the presentation or if you'd like to do, read, read them yourselves to the group, either way is fine with us. So I think, um, well, and then after that, we, anybody who didn't um, submit a question will then has a chance to ask one too live. So, okay, I think we're gonna mute everybody and we'll get started. Hello and welcome to, I'm, I'm, we're having Rosetta or is it Rosetta? Rosette. Uh, Rosette. Garcia, oops, Carmen. Anyway, Rosetta moved to North County, San Diego in 91, where she and her husband raised their two children. She earned a BS in biology from the University of Texas and previously worked for a cancer research organization. She later completed graduate study and taught in the English department at USD. She's been a consistently active and engaged community volunteer and was previously elected to the Cardiff School Board. She currently serves on the local Planned Parenthood Board, which serves San Diego, Riverside, and Imperial Counties, and is a member of the League of Women Voters. She is also a member of the San Diego Women's Foundation, where she is involved in mentoring emerging young nonprofit leaders and also chairs the committee that identifies their grants funding for each funding cycle. In her spare non-IRC, non-volunteer time, she is an avid hiker, tennis player, reader, gardener, and solver of New York Times crossword puzzles. Mm -hmm. And then we also have Amy Katarina. She is, a, is an investor relations and corporate communications consultant in the biotechnology industry, providing investor relations, public relations, marketing communications, and corporate communications consulting services. Previously, Katarina served as the head of the investor relations for Jenna Tonics, Biomedical and Dura Pharmaceuticals. She's also worked in the financial service industry at State Street Bank and Trust and the Capital Group. Katarina is currently a board member for the, I'm not sure I'm saying this right, <laughs> Lymphoderma Advocacy Group, a nonprofit organization focused on advancing lymphodermity care in the United States. As a co-founder of San Diego Schools, an education advocacy group, she counsels parents and students to help them better understand their school district operates and how their participation can improve education in San Diego County. Katarina currently serves on the Canyon Crest Academy High School Site Council. Also, she volunteers as a merit badge counselor for the San Diego Imperial Council of the Boy Scouts of America. Canarita is a graduate of Simmons College with a BA in International Business. We also have two other support people, which I believe Rosetta will introduce. Welcome to life. Thank you, Mary. I'm gonna give a little quick introduction and um, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Uh, yes. Good. Good. And then Angela is going to bring up the PowerPoint presentation that we're going to use to um, 
help uh, explain everything to you. And I think having some um, visual aids will be very helpful. Um, at the very end, of course, there'll be an opportunity for you to ask some questions. Uh, first, I want to thank everyone for inviting us to speak today on redistricting. Uh, as you know, my name is Amy Katarina, and today I'm with my fellow Commissioner Rosette Garcia and two staffers from the County of San Diego, Angela Fang and Chris Cassandra Muniz. Rosette and I currently serve as co-vice chairs on the County Redistricting Commission, and it's such an honor to be here with you today to give you an overview of why redistricting matters in San Diego County. I would like to point out, and um, Angela, if you wouldn't mind advancing the slide, thank you. I'd like to point out today that since this is an educational event and not a public hearing, I am unable to take any input today on maps, district boundaries, or communities of interest. We do want your in input on those issues, and I will provide information later in this presentation for how you can provide input. Thank you again for being here. Uh, next slide, please, thank you. So our agenda today is uh, first, what is redistricting? Second, who are the Independent Redistricting Commission, the IRC, and what do we do? Third, we'll tell you why redistricting matters and why it's important. And finally, we'll tell you how you can participate because as you will find out, your participation is very important to us. I'll turn it over now to Commissioner Garcia to share with us what redistricting is. Now I'm unmuted. <laughs> thank okay. you. Thank you, Commissioner um, Katarina. Um, again, my name is Rosette Garcia. I'm a long uh, time resident of North uh, County, San Diego. I am, um, I reside in District 5, which is where Maricosta College is as well. Uh, and I'd also like to thank uh, Mary Magro for inviting us and to the Maricosta Life Program. And of course, uh, thank all of our audience members for being here today. So let's begin with uh, the question uh, that someone asked uh, before the meeting started. What is redistricting? Redistricting is the process of redrawing district boundaries for each of our five supervisorial districts so that each has roughly equivalent populations. Let me take just a second there um, just to remind you that this is county redistricting and we have a board of supervisors um, and five elected supervisors. And um, each of those supervisors comes from a district, a different district. So we are involved in the process of redrawing district boundaries for each of those five supervisorial districts so that each has roughly equivalent populations. We redraw these boundaries every 10 years based on census data. As you know, our federal government conducts a census every 10 years, and that's when it counts all the individuals residing in the United States at the location where they live. So counting everyone who lives in our county, in our state, and actually in our country is important because our constitution sets population as the basis for sharing political power. So, Let's talk a little bit about why we draw these new boundaries every 10 years. Um, a lot changes in 10 years. Think about your own neighborhood, think about the communities, uh, the larger community around you, and think about the changes that have happened there over the last 10 years. Um, there may be neighborhoods today that didn't exist 10 years ago. So changes like these are happening all over the county. Um, communities may grow because babies are born, people move into neighborhoods, or they move from, from one place in the county to another place in the county. Communities can shrink uh, because in population because people die or move out of the county or they move to another part of the county. Areas where there were once roughly the same number of people become unequal. And um, these shifts can affect what a community looks like, who is a part of it, 
And with those changes, with those shifts can come changes in a community's priorities, in their interests, and in their goals. Whoops. So um, yeah, you can see um, on the slide an illustration of this idea. On the left, you'll see a community that's been recently um, the beneficiary of uh, redistricting, right? The population is equally divided among its districts. Now in the center image, you can see um, this, is a pop this is supposed to show a population that has experienced some change over time. And um, you can see the kinds of shifts um, that might have happened, like I just described. And as a result, the districts are now not equal in population. They're unbalanced. So the image on the far right shows how redrawing boundaries in a process called redistricting addresses those changes so that they are once again equal in population. So to recap, we redraw boundaries every 10 years in a process called redistricting so that they are equal in population and will allow for fair representation. So I'm gonna turn it back over to uh, Commissioner Katerina who will tell us a little bit more about us, about the Independent Redistricting Commission. We call ourselves the IRC. Amy? Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Wonderful. Um, so we've explained to you what redistricting is. And you may be wondering, well, who gets to draw the new boundaries? The Independent Redistricting Commission, or the IRC, is responsible for drawing the boundaries for the five supervisor districts in San Diego County. We are a commission of 14 citizen volunteers who were selected from an initial pool of nearly 300 applicants. The initial pool was narrowed by the clerk of the board of supervisors to the most 60 qualified candidates or applicants. All commissioners completed an application that involved explaining how their experiences and education indicated that they met the requirements to be a commissioner, including possessing analytical skills, the ability to understand and apply state and federal laws, the ability to be impartial, and knowledge of and appreciation for the diversity of San Diego County. Then a random drawing was conducted to select the first eight members from those 60 applicants. These eight initial commissioners were then, then reviewed the remaining applications and selected the final six commissioners based on the qualifications I just mentioned but they also had to consider other criteria such as party affiliation because the commission is required to reflect the political party breakdown of the county, Democrats, Republicans, and no party preference. The commission must also be representative of the county's diversity. So the commissioners also had to consider other factors such as gender, ethnicity, race, and geography. And here is our County of San Diego Independent Redistricting Commission. I am pleased to say that our commission satisfies all the requirements. We are a pretty diverse crew of seven women and seven men equally distributed from the five districts. In terms of party affiliation, we closely mirror the county breakdown. We are six Democrats, four Republican and four no party preference. And we bring a wide variety of backgrounds, experiences and expertise to the commission. The slide here also shows the ethnic breakdown of the commissioners compared to the county. I'm excited to be part of this worthy project and to be serving alongside these committed citizen volunteers. I'll now pass back to Commissioner Garcia to share what makes San Diego County unique in the scene of redistricting. Excuse me, we're getting some feedback from somebody. Could we re uh, uh, a mute again? Somebody, we've got a children laughing and screaming in the background. That might be me, I'm sorry. Oh, we need to, <laughs> I will oh. mute. I have a, my nephew's visiting, he's three. Hold oh, I see. Second, but oh, I'll okay. mute while I'm not speaking, no Thank problem. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Amy. Um, so 
Let's talk a little bit about San Diego County. And again, this is redistricting for the county supervisor districts. Um, so in the last redistricting, the Board of Supervisors, our elected officials, were responsible for adopting their electoral maps. And historically, that's the way it's been. Politicians have been the, the people who um, were charged with drawing the electoral maps that were used in their elections. Indeed, that is still the case in most of the country. And um, too often, the result is uh, maps that serve political interests rather than the public good and where something called gerrymandering is common. And we'll, we'll spend just a minute on gerrymandering um, in, in just a moment. So here in San Diego County, we are very fortunate. We are one of only four counties in the state who have placed the responsibility of drawing boundaries in the hands of citizens like our IRC and away from elected officials. I wanna emphasize that we must follow strict nonpartisan criteria. We'll cover that also in a moment. Um, and that is to ensure that impartiality and fairness are the basis for drawing district boundaries, as well as upholding the ideal of one person, one vote. These rules will prevent unfair practices such as gerrymandering and should result in fair maps where citizens can elect someone who will represent them. For now, I wanna emphasize that we operate as an independent commission this means that we are independent from the influence of any elected officials. We are responsible for conducting the, re the redistricting process in an open, transparent manner. And we are committed to making it possible uh, for as many uh, voices from around the county broad. We want to be as we want to um, reach out as, as broadly as possible um, and to hear from as many uh, diverse voices. Um, in this process. Next slide. Um, here's a list of our duties. We must hold public meetings. In fact, all of our business has to be conducted publicly. Uh, we have regularly scheduled IRC meetings. We're meeting twice a month on Thursdays. Um, we conduct public hearings. Uh, for These are specifically for the public to come and give us their input. And that's when we can learn about the community and especially about communities of interest. Uh, and we're just getting ready to launch these public hearings uh, in August, I believe, scheduled to be determined. Um, we must gather public testimony. We will draw draft maps that we will publish and then receive comment from the public about. And then finally, once we've gone through this uh, public and rigorous transparent process, we will adopt the final map that will be used for supervisors elections for the next decade. Again, I just have to emphasize this. We are an independent commission of citizen volunteers. We operate completely independently from the influence of our elected officials. And we are accountable only to you, the public, in our duty to draw fair and accurate maps for the county. Um, back to you. Commissioner Katarina. Thank you, uh, thank you. Um, and I'm sorry for the, um, the three-year-old in the background, but I think he will be quiet now for a little bit. He's having lunch. <laughs> I'm gonna talk today about the criteria that the IRC is required to use to draw new boundaries. The criteria are listed in the order of priority in which they must be applied. The first criterion is one that's already been mentioned districts must be of nearly equal population. This rule is required by the US Constitution. We expect to have roughly 650,000 residents in each district. Next, we must make sure that we create a map that complies with the Voting Rights Act to ensure that minorities have a fair opportunity to elect representatives of their choice. The districts must be drawn contiguously so that all parts of the district are connected to each other. Districts must minimize the division of cities, counties, neighborhood, and communities of interest to the extent possible. And districts should be geographically compact such that nearby areas of population are not bypassed for more distant population. This requirement refers to density, not shape. 
In addition, the place of residence of any incumbent or political candidate may not be considered in the creation of a map and districts may not be drawn for the purpose of favoring or discriminating against an incumbent political candidate or political party. The changing map on the right reflects the changes in the county's district boundaries from 1991 through 2011. The San Diego County specific criteria include that three of the five districts have to include unincorporated areas and two of these districts have to be comprised primarily of unincorporated areas. As a point of reference, the County of San Diego includes 18 incorporated cities, mostly in the western part of the county, as you can see on the map, but much of the county is unincorporated territory, the yellow land outside the boundaries of the 18 incorporated cities. I'll now pass it back to Commissioner Garcia to share with us why redistricting matters. Thank you, Amy. But before we do that, um, since we're in, uh, since Maricosta Col College is in um, District 5, we thought it might be um, useful and informative to just give you a little information about District 5. On this slide, you'll notice the vast diversity of land that District 5 encompasses. It, covers the northernmost area of San Diego County, and it goes all the way from the Oceanside Coast to the Palomar Mountain Range and beyond into the Anza Borrego Desert. The district is nearly 1,800 square miles and includes a number of tribal nations. It's a vast resource of nature, industry, universities, resorts, golf courses, restaurants, agriculture, and a theme park. So now let's um, talk a little bit about why redistricting matters. Uh, it matters because how maps are drawn, where those boundaries are placed, and how communities and neighborhoods get grouped together or separated can affect whose voices are heard on election day. Redistricting done properly and fairly ensures that communities can elect a representative of their choice. Um, from the point of view of redistricting at the county level, it's worth mentioning that our county board of supervisors operates a budget of over six and a half billion dollars. Yes, billion dollars. And in fact, they just recently um, passed a budget that exceeds seven billion in the, in the next year. Um, the county is the responsible agency for providing, among other things, public health like all the services around the COVID-19 response, including the distribution of vaccines. They also do election services, voter registration. They take care of county roads, parks. There are county libraries. There's law enforcement, social services like CalFresh and Medi-Cal, jails, public safety. It's a long list and I haven't even covered them all. Um, but those are the kinds of things that our board of supervisors um, are responsible for, and um, whether you live in one of the incorporated cities or in an unincorporated area of the county, and sometimes I know this can get confusing, nevertheless, the decisions made by our supervisors about how that county budget gets allocated and spent, it will affect you. So it's important that you and your community have a fair chance to elect a supervisor who will represent you and your community's interests. Um, here's another reason, or, or just to put a finer point on it. Redistricting also matters because it can affect a community's ability to elect a representative of their choice, which is what we've been saying. How does that happen? I have a slide here that illustrates the point. You can see uh, two diagrams of the same population on this slide in each you'll see that they've been divided into four equal districts. But in the image on the top, you see a map where the minority population, which makes up 25% of the entire population, has been separated. And by being separated, their voices have effectively been silenced. Um, the minority population in that scenario is not likely to have a fair shot at electing someone who will represent them. In the, in the bottom image, you see an alternative scheme, one that keeps this minority population largely intact, 
so that they are now a majority of the population in one district. So one out of four districts has this majority minority, um, which is actually a fair map because it accurately reflects the population. One out of four of the residents in this community is a member of that minority. So redistricting can keep people with common interests, identity, language, and history bundled together so they can effectively advocate for themselves and make their voices heard in local affairs, or it can deliberately uh, separate them, and that's called gerrymandering, and silence their voices. So gerrymandering, as you may know, is the practice of dividing or arranging election, election districts in a way that gives one political party an unfair advantage in elections. Independent redistricting, independent redistricting commissions like the one in San Diego County, like our IRC, provide a safeguard against gerrymandering and help promote drawing of fair maps where people can elect representatives of their choice. So um, Commissioner Katarina, I think now maybe we wanna talk about the data, what, what information that we're gonna to use to help us to guide us in drawing those boundaries. Thank you, Commissioner Garcia. We've talked about what redistricting is, who is responsible for redistricting, and what criteria are used in redistricting. But what about the data? How will the IRC know what changes in the population have taken place so that they can draw new boundaries? First, we will get census data obtained from the 2020 census count, which will come to us in a variety of ways. Second, we use public input, input we gather from you to help us learn and understand communities of interest. A community of interest or a COI for short, is a population that shares a common social and economic interest that should be included within a single district for the purposes of its effective and fair representation. Communities of interest are not defined by their relationship with political parties, incumbents, or political candidates. Again, a community of interest is one that shares common social or economic interest. A COI might coalesce around the fact that it shares a common culture or a common language, but there are many other ways to define a COI. An example of a COI might be a neighborhood that is adjacent to a shipping port because that community shares common interests pertaining to dealing with the impacts or effects of having a shipping port as a neighbor. A critical source of information, maybe the most important critical source about COIs will necessarily come from the public, from people telling us about their COI. The census data will give us some information about neighborhoods and communities, but it won't necessarily tell us about issues and concerns that bring a community together. So how do you know if you belong to a COI? Does your neighborhood share certain celebrations or traditions like street festivals or parades? Are there important places where your community gathers like parks or community centers or community colleges? What is the history of how your community came together? Other questions you may ask, are you part of a community who has issues that have not been adequately addressed by your elected representatives? Has your community come together to advocate for important services such as better schools, roads, or health centers in your neighborhood? Have you worked for more recognition or support of your community, like having holidays recognized or historical events commemorated? These are the kinds of factors or interests that might help identify a community of interest. I want to remind you today that we cannot take information about communities of interest. We will do those during public hearings starting in August. This is an educational session for you to learn more about redistricting, but there are many ways and we will offer the public many opportunities to tell us about their community, communities of interest and we will be sure to provide you with that information. We will be conducting a minimum of seven public hearings, again, starting in August. These hearings are intended to give the residents of San Diego County the opportunity to participate in the redistricting process by providing us public input on COIs. But you do not need to attend one of these hearings to provide public input on your community of interest. You can provide oral testimony at a public hearing. You could submit a written testimony at any time via email or regular mail. You could draw a map 
we will have an electronic tool on our website. I think it's going live today, or you can submit a paper map. You can provide as much detail about your community and the characteristics or issues that bind you together and why you should not be separated. There's a lot that needs to be accomplished during the redistricting process. Commissioner Garcia will share with you a bit about the redistricting timeline. Thank you, Amy. So on the slide, you'll see a timeline that shows the activities and the timing that uh, we are planning from now until the final map is adopted. Um, this timeline begins in June, although we've been, um, uh, we've, we've been formed and meeting uh, and doing business since um, actually late last year. Um, but we're actually at the end of um, our education tour phase. This is probably the last event that we'll be doing. And um, it says on this timeline that in mid-July, we expected to begin public hearings. Um, in fact, we're not starting until early August. Um, and that's where we'll be learning and gathering as much information as we can about um, communities of interest in the county. And uh, sometime in late August, we're expecting the US Census Bureau to finally release um, raw data to the states. Um, and then it will be processed by one of our statewide agencies and um, we'll get the data from them in late September. Uh, so shortly after that, in early to mid-October, we will begin drawing draft maps. Each draft map will be published and made available for public comment. And we will again be holding public hearings, um, at least two of them, during this map drawing phase to hear from the public about the proposed new boundaries. Um, our current deadline to adopt a final map for the county is December 15th. Um, but I want to point out that this is a tentative timeline based on current information and all the dates, including the final map adoption date deadline are subject to change. Um, and I'd like to speak for a moment about why we can, these, this timeline is tentative and why these dates might still be in flux. Um, you may have heard that the census data has been delayed. Um, that's not a rumor, it's true. In fact, it has been significantly delayed, not once, but twice and, and the dates, uh, uh, um, we rely on the census data. We cannot do our work without the census data. And so um, at this point, we're still a little unclear as to when we're gonna actually get that information from the Census Bureau. Typically the census data would have arrived by April and we would be finished with our work by the end of the summer. Instead, we are not going to get it until maybe mid to late August. Um, and then it's going to take another month for the state to get that data into um, the formatting that will be usable by us and by the public. Um, so the initial delay from the Census Bureau resulted in an extension of the deadline from August 15th to December 15th. That's the deadline we're currently operating under. But because, as I said, there have been further delays, um, it's not clear if we're going to actually have further extensions of the deadline so that we can um, maintain the amount of time that was supposed to be available for public participation and public input. Um, so I would just ask you to stay tuned. Our priority is to ensure that the public has ample opportunity to participate in the process and also to ensure that we have the time we need to gather all the information to draw fair and accurate maps. Um, delays are not usually desirable, but we're trying to put a silver lining on this gray cloud. We are trying to see this extra time as a bonus. It's additional time for us to um, learn more, dig deeper, um, reach out to the community um, and have events like this, which we might not have had time for in a previous um, uh, world, previous um, non-COVID world, um, but we have this time now and um, we're, we're committed to learning as much as we can about the county, its diverse communities, and especially about communities of interest. It's a bonus for the public as well, since it gives the public, you, extra time to work together, um, learn more about redistricting, and then advocate for yourselves in this process. Um, 
we're just about done. I'd like to end um, with a story. It's a specific example of a community here in San Diego County where public input made a difference. Prior to the last redistricting cycle in 2010, the Barrio Logan community in South San Diego was split between two county supervisorial districts. A portion of Barrio Logan was assigned to District 1, and another portion was assigned to District 4. So during that 2010 redistricting process, the community stepped up, they stepped forward, and they told the county about the fact that they had been separated and they requested that they be unified into one supervisorial district. The county heard them. And when the map was redrawn, the community of Barrio Logan was restored. And today they are assigned wholly to district one. That might not have happened were it not for the public input that was, um, that was provided. So with that, we're gonna wrap up with information about how you can participate. And I'm gonna turn it back over to Commissioner Katarina for that. Thank you. As I promised at the beginning of the meeting, here are the ways for the public to participate in the San Diego County redistricting process. You can attend one of our meetings. The regularly scheduled IRC meetings are every second and fourth Thursday of the month, uh, public hearings, and you can attend the public hearings and offer public comment there. Currently, all of our meetings are held virtually, but they are open to the public. All meetings, public hearings, etc., will be published on our website and you can visit our website to get that information. You can spread the word to others to attend one of our virtual education tours or attend a public hearing. We have, um, we, we, we are trying to do as many of these educational tours as possible. Uh, you can also go to our website and click on the invite a commissioner to speak button to make a request. Or if you want to attend a tour, uh, want to attend a hearing, uh, please visit our website. Even if you don't attend a meeting, presentation, or hearing, you can always submit your comments via email and regular mail. The address is up on the slide. And finally, to stay informed about what is happening, you can subscribe to our email list to receive information about meetings, hearings, and other information about redistricting. Um, so please subscribe to our email list. You'll get notices of the hearings and our meetings as well. Soon, uh, actually not soon, today, we have a tool available on our website that will allow you to draw a map describing your COI. Um, this tool is just being introduced. It's still a beta version, uh, but you can, you can test it out if you'd like, or I think next week we'll have the final, final tool uh, within a week or two. Um, that concludes our presentation today, but I wanna make sure you leave today's presentation with a few takeaways. First, redistricting only happens once every 10 years. Residents of San Diego County have a once in a decade opportunity to engage in the redistricting process. And don't miss your chance to help us draw the maps that we will use for the next decade. Commissioner Garcia, what else would you like our audience to take away? We are committed. I hope you heard this loud and clear. Uh, this IRC is committed to drawing fair and accurate maps for our five supervisorial districts to ensure that you have a fair chance to elect a supervisor who represents you. We're also committed to making it possible to hear from as many uh, uh, diverse voices um, around the county, all corners of the county. Uh, let us know how we can make this happen. We cannot do this work without your input. Please help us do the best job we can for you. Thank you. If you, if you would like to contact the IRC, please reach out via email, phone, or through our website. We want and need to hear from you. Thank you again for inviting us to speak with your community today on the current redistricting efforts for San Diego County. Thank you very much, both of you, for your very interesting and informative presentation. Um, we do have some questions, which I guess I will read, and you know, you can whoever wants to answer it can can do so. Um, due to COVID, how accurate is last year's census? Um, Amy, do you want, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe we don't know. <laughs> well, you know what? It is the data that we have. It, it is the data that we have. And until we get the census information, we won't know, uh, the quality, but 
but we do know, and I know that in San Diego County, we had an amazing uh, outreach effort. I mean, there were over a hundred different organizations working with SANDAG to make sure that people received their census and that they filled it out. And there, it was an extensive program. It was incredibly um, impressive. So I personally feel confident that San Diego has a uh, very good input because of the effort that the community took to make sure that the data was um, collected. Um, I, I can't really attest to other areas, but I feel pretty confident that San Diego uh, made every effort to, to gather this data. Well, in fact, we, we um, attended a, um, a seminar, a workshop, and we heard that San Diego County actually outperformed um, the last census in terms of the, the rate of response. So I, I would venture to say that the, the census data that we're going to be using is, um, is going to be pretty um, reliable source of information. Okay, someone wants to know who decides how many will be included in each district. Is it just total population divided by five or is there some other way? No, it's total population divided by five. That's exactly right. And there is some wiggle room. I mean, it, obviously we can't get it exactly equal. Um, we have um, a five to 10% um, margin, um, but, but that is the most important criteria. It is the, the highest priority. So that's, that's where we'll start. And I hope everybody understands why each why um, equal population in, in districts is important. Mm. Someone wants to know, can you give me an example of a community of interest? Um, I have one. I think a lot of people can relate to this. Adams Avenue has uh, a big fair every year. If you go to the Adams Avenue Street Fair, so they could make an argument that they are a community of interest. And so for example, perhaps Adam, Adams Avenue shouldn't be cut off between 35th Street and 36th Street because that whole community is part of their, uh, their fair uh, and part of what makes us successful and draws a lot of people to the area. And one of the reasons you don't wanna split a district is that it, it is difficult then if you have a problem. So let's use the Barrio Logan uh, example. If they had had a problem that they needed to get resolved and they went to a supervisor from district one or supervisor from district two, both supervisors could say, it's not my responsibility, it's the other person's. And then they're left with, with no assistance. Um, so that's really why, I mean, that's just one example of why you wanna have, have these, um, groups contained. Another example may be a school district. Uh, school districts rely on the county for information and it is a lot easier to have one supervisor uh, working with uh, working, you know, with that individual school district rather than having to go to two different supervisors. Exactly. All right, someone wants to know, is there any promotion of an IRC format for the rest of the country? Yes. If, you, if the question there is, are, um, are there groups working to um, move jurisdictions from um, politicians drawing the lines to public, to citizens drawing the lines? Yes. Um, and that's actually what happened in the state of California. We're, we're talking to you today about the county, um, but there is a statewide redistricting commission. Um, there's a city of San Diego redistricting commission. <laughs> And there is, there are other states who have moved, not many, um, who have moved to um, these independent redistricting commissions. It's, it's an uphill climb, I would say. Um, but yes, there are, um, the League of Women Voters, for example, is um, one of the organizations that has, that was instrumental in moving this forward in the state of California and they're working in other states. So, yeah. Okay, someone wants to know what if a COI shares a common negative interest like drug use or, ne or gangs, um, is a majority always right? I, 
I think that's a valid question. Um, I would I would argue that in that particular case, if there are resources that are needed, it is better to keep the community whole to try to resolve the problem rather than split it up. And again, you get into that, well, it's not my problem, it's their problem kind of issue. So, so even though it's a negative, this is actually something that the county can help with because they are tasked with our public health. And so, and they are involved in, um, in dealing with these kinds of problems. So I would say yes, even in a negative case, you would wanna keep your community uh, intact so that you can get the access to the resources you need to resolve the problem. Okay. How are these 10 year maps used in addition to supervisorial elections? Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but we draw the map after the census data comes in. Okay. And, and then those are the, that will describe, that will, those will be the districts for the next 10 years. So all the elections that take place uh, and the supervisors are elected in, not all of them are elected in the same year. So it's, I think you generally have a supervisor election in one of the districts every two years. So there's no in addition to supervisorial elections. I'm not sure I understand the question. These are the maps that will be used in those elections. Does that make I sense? Think, I think I understand. I think I understand what, what they're getting at. Uh, so the city of San Diego has an independent redistricting commission and they are working on drawing the maps for the city council boundaries. But the state of California independent redistrict commission, they are drawing the maps for a number of different types of boundaries. So they draw the maps obviously for Congress. So our congressional maps are drawn by the state commission, but they also are responsible for drawing the assembly districts and the Senate districts for the state of California. And they also draw, I believe it is the equalization board districts. Okay. Someone comments that illegal immigrants have been reluctant to provide census data. Is there any provision made for that in the mapping? I, I don't, Amy, do you have an answer for that? I'm not sure that I have a, an accurate one that I'm prepared to. <laughs> um, neither of us, well, we are soon becoming experts, let me tell you. So if, if someone doesn't identify themselves in the census, it is, very difficult for us to be able to identify them separately. So we have to use the census data that is provided. Mm -hmm. um, I, I do know that um, the census is intended to count every person who lives in the United States of America, who is living in the United States of America. Um, and it frankly, it doesn't matter and it shouldn't matter whether you're here on a visa or you came across the border on the trolley for the day. If you are in location on the date of the census and you are given a census form to fill out in your home, and if there are five people in there or two, you need to fill it out correctly. Um, and and that, is, uh, that, that is how the system is set up. Unfortunately, as we know, some people uh, have expressed hesitancy uh, in disclosing their their uh, status as a as a person in this country, but um, uh, I, I hope that everyone took advantage of the fact that the form comes to the home and whoever is living in the home at that time should be counted. Okay, someone wonders why is census data, data census data so late? Well, partially um, because of the pandemic and it became difficult for um, census workers. So there's some people fill out the census. Um, you could fill it out online. You could get you could get a paper, you know, you could get it in 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 the mail and return that. And then also census workers would go around to neighborhoods and count count people that way. And so that part of it really got stymied by um, COVID. So that's one reason there were some, there were some other um, 
administrative, let's say, administrative reasons why the Census Bureau wasn't able to um, to process the data and get the data to the states in a timely fashion. Okay, someone just has a comment. This has been very helpful in understanding our system. He appreciates all your intense work on that. Thank you. And then someone says, are commissioners ever pressured by interest groups? And if so, how do they, how do you cope? Amy? Well, we have, um, uh, we have bylaws that describe and, and dictate our behavior. And in the case of someone contacting us uh, to put pressure on us, we would disclose it in a contact log uh, and we would put it uh, in the public record in that manner. Um, so for example, if my neighbor came over to me and said, I really think our neighborhood should be a community of interest, it would be my obligation to then uh, ask them to submit that information in, in one of the public hearings or via mail or to draw a map using our, um, our, our community builder map, um, and, but also to disclose it myself because if that resident doesn't speak up, then it needs to be, I need to disclose it. And I, and that, I, not that I don't trust my neighbor, but you know, wanna make sure that all these comments get in so that when it does come time for us to make these difficult decisions, we will have as much information and that's the most important part. We'll have as much information as we can. Um, we, do, um, we do not co communicate with the, uh, uh, the county supervisorial uh, candidates or current uh, supervisors or their staff or their family. Uh, no Twitter likes, no Facebook posts, no nothing. Um, and, and so, you know, we really try to be independent and, and that's part of why we were chosen is that it, we are people who, who are known to have integrity and to be um, unbiased. Okay, someone questions, what arguments did Barrio Logan use to be reunited? Um, we can get back with you on that, but I would just imagine, so a community of interest is a community that shares, that has some sort of common social or economic interests. And so that community of Barrio Logan, you know, they're a neighborhood, they probably, uh, deal with a lot. They probably share um, common goals and priorities. They have, they share issues and problems that they'd like to have solved. Um, you know, Amy, Amy mentioned already other examples of communities of interest. One I can think of is um, if you're a coastal, you know, if, if you're a community along the coast and you're you know, you know that your community is very interested in protecting, I don't know, protecting um, the ocean. Um, that might be a community of interest. Um, so um, I see the next question is what kind of issues were used in forming um, our current C uh, communities of interest? There are many, many, many. Um, and it, it, it could be, um, Maybe you live in a neighborhood that's um, a lot of refugees from a from a particular country. That might, and you have specific concerns um, that you'd like, uh, and like you know, you'd like to be able to uh, be together to advocate on behalf of yourselves. Um, so it it's any number of things. Uh, maybe you're by the Del Mar Fairgrounds. I'm just thinking, and and you feel like you have very specific needs or priorities um, or goals about how you want the county to deal with that. So it's any number of things. Okay, Anne Marie wants to know if the current district da data is very different compared with last data, can something be done? Does the county look into it? I guess is everything on the up and up. Are you talking about the census yeah. data, Anne Marie? Anne Marie? Yes. Okay. 
Um, you know, I don't want to speak out of turn and I wouldn't want to send you down a path that I, that I'm not sure about. Um, you know, my understanding is our primary source of data is the census data. Um, and, and we do believe, I, I feel very confident and we do believe that San Diego County, um, as Rosette mentioned, had one of the highest participation rates um, and because they do know, right? They know how many homes um, they do follow up. So if, if there's a home that was uh, reported last census and didn't report this census, there's a group that can reach out to the residents in that home, even though they couldn't go in person, but they could go and see, okay, did the home burn down? Was the home move, you know, is the home still uh, occupied? So, uh, you know, as I mentioned, there were over a hundred different um, organizations working across the county to make sure that census forms were turned in. So I feel, I feel very confident that our data is going to be good. I, some, some counties may not be as lucky as we are, um, but I, I'm not sure if there's another uh, mechanism to, to uh, change, change the information at mm -hmm. this point. Let, let me just say that um, there are many checks along the way. And um, I, I believe that the Census Bureau and the data that we're gonna get from the Census Bureau will be reliable. Um, I have heard nothing um, to indicate that we should be concerned about that. And just to also mention, we do have one of our commissioners is actually an expert on this and it's too bad he's not on the panel with us today. Um, he's a demographer and um, he could probably speak to this um, with a lot, um, you know, a lot more um, confidence. But what I wanted to point out is that we also um, have hired a consultant, a demographer consultant, um, who will be guiding us in all of this. And again, we haven't heard from anyone so far that we should be concerned that the data that we're getting is um, questionable and not reliable. Thank you. Okay. Someone wants to know, how do you deal with a highly fluid and changing migrant population coming into our county? The, the census count the, is the census count. Um, and, and that's, you know, it, it, as, as we described, it's the, the, the population of people residing in our county at, at the time that the count was taken. So, so it doesn't fluctuate at all, then it's just that one date when the census was taken and that's it. They, they do, they, there are some adjustments that are made. Again, those are by, made by, you know, highly qualified technical uh, demographic specialists. And I, you know, they, they do make some adjustments, uh, you know, adjustments but um, they're, it's, it's a, it's basically a, a point in time count, I would say. Right. Okay. Who decides if a new additional district is necessary? We'll have to get back with you on that. I, I think it's the voters actually, but I'm not, I don't quote me on that. Okay. <laughs> I don't know staff, just maybe our staff, um, Angela or Cassandra. That's a great question though. We haven't, yeah. we haven't had that question yet. Well, maybe you can let Mary Magro know, email her and then she can get that information to all the rest of us. Great. Okay, someone says, if I am in the center of a district, is there any point in contacting IRC regarding a COI? Amy? I would say absolutely yes, because you don't know where those boundaries are going to be shifted. So if you look at what happened in districts five and three last census, the entire community of Rancho Santa Fe was moved from district three to district five. So yes, it does, it does matter and it is important. Luckily they didn't split it in half. That would have been worse, right? <laughs> okay. Are infrastructure aspects considered such as water systems, electrical grids, freeways, borders, et cetera? 
you know, I can tell you just from working with our uh, consultants that th these issues are important and you could certainly make a justification that they are communities of interest. Uh, so for example, we have a variety of water districts and they probably want to stay in one, dist in one supervisorial district because it, again, if you have to go to two different people, the chances of you having a successful outcome are much more reduced. So um, those, are, those are certainly areas that we are looking at communicating with and making sure that they give us um, their input. Some information is kind of, if you will, hardwired into the demographic analysis networks. So they know already the boundaries of the cities. Uh, they know already um, some of the, the, the commonalities in the county. Um, and really uh, what we're looking for from our, from our community partners is, you know, what's important to you? What's something that you know that's important to stay together that we might not know? Um, so for example, if there's a, um, a, a planned community that could be split and you wanna keep your community together, um, that might be something that you could, uh, you know, you could contribute to as a community of interest. Okay. Um, if a city already has, has already a COI districts, can you use it for your own purpose? I'm not quite sure. Anne Marie, do you want to explain what you mean by that? Well, the, 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 the community of interest have already been defined within the city. This is in the case of Escondido. So you have that data there. Can you use that for your supervisorial district? My understanding is that we are looking um, at all of these different organizations um, within, within the cities. Um, and I know that our outreach coordinator is also reaching out to, to all of these groups. Uh, could an individual uh, come in and say, I wanna make sure that this area is considered a community of interest? Absolutely. Um, I, you know, again, uh, we need you to tell us what is important in your neighborhood. What is your community of interest? And if, if it is, let's just say a, a, a water district, then that's fine. Uh, we, we need to hear that. We need to hear it's important. I think I, I want to, I just want to um, um, talk a minute about communities of interest. They are not static. In other words, a community of interest is not um, designated and then we always know that that's a community of interest and they're always there. W the communities of interest are actually sort of um, organic. Dynamic. Yeah. Dynamic, yes. Uh, communities that, uh, that appear and maybe disappear or do you see what I mean? So I don't want you to think that, that all of this you know, that, th that this work has been done and we already know what all the communities of interest are. The communities of interest that, that um, spoke up 10 years ago um, may or may not still, you know, have the same issues and concerns. That those communities, like we said, communities change over time. So um, it would be important to, um, if, if you have a community, if you know of a community of interest, if you're part of a community of interest, um, to make that known to the various jurisdictions who are drawing boundaries. Would, would you agree with that, Amy? Yes, I think that's fair, yep. Okay, the next question, how does county redistricting impact the city of Carlsbad redistricting this year? Um, they're completely, I would say that they're completely separate. Um, we are, uh, and you might recall this from a, a slide earlier, uh, we are to the extent possible um, required to keep cities, uh, known communities together. So the city of Carlsbad, we would, I mean, it would, it would, it would take some really extraordinary circumstance for us to draw a, a county supervisor's district that cut Carlsbad in half. We, would, we need to keep cities uh, intact as, as much as possible. And in, in the earlier question, somebody asked about um, 
infrastructure and highways and that sort of thing. We also um, should, as much as possible, as much as we can, follow natural boundaries. And sometimes highways are a, a boundary that we would use to sort of naturally draw um, a boundary between two supervisors districts. So anyway, maybe a long answer, but I don't think, I can't think of a way, there may be a way that the county redistricting impacts Carlsbad, but I, I don't, I can't think of one. Maybe you can, Amy. I don't think it impacts it. Okay. Okay, the next question, does tax revenue play a part such as like property taxes or sales taxes or anything? Mm -hmm. Not, I mean, not in our decision making. That isn't a criteria that we look at. Uh, I think it ultimately does um, play into um, how a supervisor um, works within within their district. But but we don't. Um, we would not have any um, any connection to that. One of the things to think about uh, is that we have a lot of rural area in the eastern part of the county. And so, and, and our county charter indicates that we need to have at least two supervisorial districts in rural areas so that those supervisors have, have some a populated area and some very, very rural area. And, and that would mean that you wouldn't wanna have one supervisor who just has 100% rural community um, so they, they do, we do try to balance uh, the, 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 the demographics, if you will, of the county itself uh, as well. Okay. And someone says, it seems that only those areas that are on the fringe between two or more districts would be impacted. W would that be true? I think Amy answered this question. I'll let you go at it again, Amy. <laughs> <laughs> well, we think about this a lot and it's an excellent question and you're right. Uh, when you when you think about how to how to best uh, look at and 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 it is something we're in considering in our targeting the people who are on the rim of the districts are the ones who have the most change but you know we don't know we don't know for sure how the population has shifted has it shifted more to North County has it shifted out of the city has it shifted to South County so, so we could see boundaries change in ways that they haven't previously. And again, even if you just look at the story about Rancho Santa Fe, uh, so Rancho Santa Fe, count, the whole unincorporated area went to District 5, and then District 3 got the entire area of Escondido. Um, and again, depending on how the population has grown or shrunk or shifted, those communities, all of those communities could be impacted. And those are large, those are large communities. If you think about how many people live in Escondido and how many people reside in, in Rancho Santa Fe community. Right. And we've got one last question here on the chat thing. Can age be considered as an interest group? Do we want old areas and or young areas? That, you know, that kind of thing. I mean, and Rosette, you can speak to this too. I would say absolutely. If there is a community that is, is you know, let's just say there's a, a residential community for uh, citizens over the age of 55, um, they have something in common. And would, would that community, which could be vast, uh, would that community want to be split? And if the answer is no, then, and yes, absolutely, you could consider that community a community of interest. Okay. Agree. And, and just before it looks like we're wrapping up, I just wanted to point out, um, I, I wanted to mention our two staffers who are with us today, Angela Fang, who was actually um, key in putting our slides together. I thought she did a great job. Mm -hmm. And Cassandra Muniz. Um, and so, She's a, a graduate, she just finished her graduate studies, and I just wanted to thank them for helping um, us today and, and handling the slides and just wanted to, to uh, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Cassandra. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Now, if anybody has any um, questions that they didn't ask on the chat, now is your time to unmute yourself and raise your hand and ask a question. I wanted to ask a question. and. Uh, so the city of San Diego, the population of the city of San Diego is so huge. 
how can it not, compared to all the rest of the county, um, how can it not be split into two pieces, two districts rather, or is it split into two districts? Go ahead. So I can address I can address that in a, in, in a way, and 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 we we're not going to guarantee what's going to happen in this next cycle because we haven't done it yet. We don't have our data, and again, we could have seen shifts out of the city into the into the country, and especially during COVID, this did happen, uh, as as we know. But right now, District Four, which is primarily the city of San Diego, is the largest district, by about twenty thousand residents. The other districts are under 700,000 and District 4 is above 700,000. The smallest districts are going to be the two districts that have the predominant rural areas. Um, and um, District 3 actually is one of those. Uh, so sorry, District 3 actually right now has a smaller uh, population than District 5. But District 5 and District 2 are the two residential and they're, they're the, in the bottom grouping. So, um, you know, right now, the way it was done in 2010 was to keep the city of San Diego intact and recognize that they are going to have um, a, a larger population, but it's still, it's still within the realm of an acceptable range. Um, and, 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 you know, it is, it is complicated, right? Because of these rural communities have fewer people. Uh, it's, a, it's a vast amount of area. Um, and, um, you know, but that's, that was what was done in 2010. I can't tell you what we're going to do because we haven't seen the data yet. Okay. Okay. Ella Schubert, I think you had a question. Yes. Um, regarding the census data, um, the cities that redistrict, um, because of council elections, do they get their census data directly from the county or directly from the census bureau? So I believe that they'll get it from the statewide agency that's going to be processing the data. So the Census Bureau sends the data to each of the states, and then the states distribute it to the jurisdictions. So we'll be getting county data for our redistricting purposes, and I would believe all the other jurisdictions would get theirs again from the state. We, we don't we don't distribute to anybody else no thank you i have a question yes mary the marine core base do you consider that because they're transitory do you count them in a district yes everyone residing in the county every individual yep district five consists of oceanside Vista, San Marcos, is Escondido in there? No. Not, not no, at all, Amy, or a little sliver. I can't remember, but the large part of it, it definitely. I, is district I three. think it's. I think it's all in District Three, unless there's an unincorporated area that's attached to Escondido that might be in in another in District Five. But so my, is that just those yeah. three: Oceanside, Vista, San Marcos? That's right. And, and keeps going all the way east to the end of the county. And does it go to the north above, include Camp Pendleton? Yeah. Yes. It includes Palomar as well, right? Yep. All the way out. Include, to includes Palomar. Palomar. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Well, thank you all very much for this. Very educational. Yes. yes. Thank very you. All, thank you. You all gave us a, a run for our money with your very good questions. Thank you. <laughs> We're an inquisitive group. I'm going to stop the recording right now. And thanks for your service.